Welcome, everyone. I'm, um, I'm so glad to welcome you to this Emerging Scholars Network conversation. Uh, my name is Bob Truby, and I serve as the National Director of the Emerging Scholars Network. Uh, uh, orthodoxy has been under fire of late. Bishop uh, John Shelby Spong famously wrote, uh, uh, he famously wrote some years ago, Christianity must change or die with scandals, the growth of politicized Christianity with, with anti-science rhetoric and uh, much more, many people are headed to the exit saying something has got to change. And many are taking up uh, Spong's chorus. Uh, Trevin Wax would argue that one thing that m ought not change are the foundations of the faith, what he would call orthodoxy. And we're gonna be talking about that today. Uh, before we begin, let me just orient you to a few things for our time together. Uh, number one, uh, we will be recording today's conversation. If you prefer not to be recorded, please keep your mic muted, disable your video. By continuing to participate in the ESN conversation with your video and or audio enabled after the recording begins, you can send to allow InterVarsity uh, to use the recording in any screenshots of our conversation for InterVarsity ministry purposes, including posting a video recording online for asynchronous viewing. I'll stop recording now uh, to allow you to disable video. Uh, your audio should already be muted. And if you, uh, if you prefer not to be recorded. Our uh, guest today is Trevin Wax. He's the Vice President of Research and Resource Development at the North American Mission Board. And he's a visiting professor at Cedarville University. A former missionary to Romania, Trevin is a regular columnist at the Gospel Coalition and has contributed to the Washington Post, Religion News Service, and Christianity Today, which named him one of 33 millennials, uh, shaping the next generation of evangelicals. He served as a general editor of the Gospel Project and has taught courses on mission and ministry at Wheaton College. He is the author of multiple books, including the book we're discussing today, The Thrill of Orthodoxy, The Multidirectional Leader, Rethink Yourself, This Is Our Time, and Gospel-Centered Teaching. He and his wife, Karina, have three children. So welcome, Trevin. I'm going to spotlight you uh, as well, and uh, we'll get into it. Thank you, Bob. It's really good to be with you and glad to be with everybody that uh, is, has joined the Zoom call today. Well, we really appreciate you taking uh, taking the time to be with us uh, uh, with uh, everything else that I'm sure you're doing as well. Uh, well, you know, just to get us right into it, Trevin, I, I wondered if we might take a few minutes for you to just tell us how you came to write this particular book. Well, you know, I think um, I've, I've had a burden in, in recent years that um, with the, the, the different scandals and the, the the challenges that have been facing the church of uh, there's been a loss of confidence in the the beauty and the goodness of christian teaching and uh christianity at its foundational core what that is and what that looks like and there's been a lot of unrest there's been a lot of um uh of of questions i think of of doubts there's been all sorts of challenges that have faced the church and in moments like that, I think what's what's really important is for us to 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 regain a sure footing and to want to make sure that we are standing on something sturdy. And so I think every generation faces this this challenge of of wondering, you know what what's true, what's enduring, what's lasting. And um, when a lot of things are up in the air and you're not really sure where to go or how the church should respond or how you personally should be part of what I hope would be a, a, a restoration, a reconstructing, a rebuilding of the church's witness in the, in the years to come, um, I think what's most important is for us to go back to the basics. Um, what are those things that have stood the test of time? What are those areas where the, the, the church has 
demonstrated substantial agreement over the centuries. Um, what are those areas where we can be confident that 100 years from now, 200 years from now, you know, Christians are still going to be gathering all over the world and are going to be confessing the same truths about, about Jesus, who he is and what he's done for us. And so I had a burden for, for, to, for, to that, to, to, not, to not simply talk about that, but to show the beauty of that. And so it really, this was a, this was a hard book to write hard, harder, I think than any other book that I've been involved with, including a PhD dissertation that became a book at some point, because the, the, the level, the, what I was shooting for w- was high. I really wanted to, to, um, uh, to, to not just talk about the thrill of orthodoxy, but to have readers experience something of, of that, that beauty and that thrill of, of mm-hmm. coming into a, an encounter with, um, uh, with with truth as it's been delivered to us. Well, uh, I one of the things I found in the mid of it, midst of it is I, I I felt the beauty and passion of your book come through, and I, I you know I, I it was obvious that there was a lot of yourself that you put into this thing that it was something you were very deeply convinced about. This is an academic crowd, and we like definitions, <laughs> and so I wonder if you might define orthodoxy as you use it in the book. I actually mentioned doing this conversation with someone who said, uh, who's orthodoxy? So I wonder if you might talk about what you mean by that and how uh, and, 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 and how that can be a term of shared meaning. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And one, uh, the question of definition is one that, that we academics always are asking and should be asking, quite frankly. Um, I knew when I was putting the book together in the initial proposal, stage and then beginning the writing process, I was going to have to answer that question, uh, even though this is not IVP academic publishing this, but just university. I, I wanted, um, I knew that we would have to address that question early on. Um, there are lots, of course, there's there there's what, what some would say would be capital O orthodoxy. There's Eastern orthodoxy, uh, the entire branch of the, the Christian tree, so to speak. That's not the orthodoxy that I've got in mind as I'm uh, writing about this, this is a little o orthodoxy in some sense, um, in, in that it's not orthodoxy of a particular branch of the tree. You know, there's uh, some would say, well, there's reformed orthodoxy, and you know, there's uh, um, uh, uh, Catholic canons and councils and things that uh, since the the Reformation and since the the split with the Eastern Church, and there's all sorts of ways that we could define what orthodoxy is for a particular tribe. But I, I decided early on that I wanted to, to um, the, for this particular project, I wanted it to be a, um, uh, I, to be orthodoxy, small o orthodoxy in the sense of what has been believed uh, always uh, by everyone everywhere in the Christian tradition. So you take this, this, this would be, for example, the way Thomas Oden defines, uh, he calls it classic or consensual uh, um, Christianity, in which he's talking about that that core Trinitarian, those doctrines that are um, uh, at the core of, of mm-hmm. Christian faith, and which also are laid out in the 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 three dominant creeds that virtually all Christians everywhere uh, affirm, uh, which would be the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the the Athanasian Creed. Um, and so those earliest ecumenical councils, those creeds, it's really the superstructure of the Christian faith. This is the foundational teaching that all Christians, whether Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant, agree and say, this is a representation of what it is that we believe. This is what we confess. Um, so so when we talk about orthodoxy um, in this book, I'm going back to that to those those particular uh, things. But then I'm also, I, I do bring up some some different elements that have been unchanging uh, and have been dominant throughout the church's witness as well. So I don't, I don't take a minimalist approach to the creeds. Some people will say today, as long as you know, you affirm these bare essentials, you know, that's basically, that's orthodoxy. And we don't have to to affirm anything other than that or go beyond that. Um, I think that there are actually, there's a lot in these particular lines of affirmation that we have in, in the creeds, which are summaries of scripture, which actually takes us, take us back to scripture and a more robust, a, a more uh, a, a expansive vision of what it is that these creeds actually imply and what they are affirming. And so 
Um, I, I actually think we have history throughout, um, uh, you know, the the tradition of the church. Uh, great theologians have seen the creeds in that way. In fact, when they have uh, countered different heresies that came up along the line, they've done so by by taking a more expansive view of what is actually implied in those those uh, those affirmations of the faith that we all agree on. So, so I'm I'm speaking of orthodoxy, going back to those ecumenical creeds, saying these are the church has seen these as accurate time-tested, enduring expressions of what the scriptures themselves teach. And, uh, and, and looking at that as this is the, a, a, a really good definition of what uh, orthodoxy means in the, in the mere Christianity uh, um, sort of, uh, of approach. Well, your, your discussion of, of both uh, your definition, but also the idea of the ways that you expand upon those basics really raises a question. Uh, you know, it seems that in some places, everything's foundational. And you can be read out if you disagree about almost anything. Uh, how do you discern between what is truly foundational, what is essential and has been shared by the church through history, and what's not? And how do we deal with the things where uh, that are not, but and where we have disagreement. Well, I think we've. I mean, I'm I'm speaking and writing as a as as a as a Protestant. Um, so, mm -hmm. in speaking of this, I'm I'm taking us back to Scripture to want to say um, we've got to get our foundations in Scripture. The, the the creeds have power only in so much as they are summaries of of Scripture. But I do I do think that uh, we've got Scripture alongside. Um, we, we've got scripture as the foundation, but then we've also, we, we've also got the church around the world and, uh, the church throughout history to help us understand some of the distinctions between, uh, what, what is foundational and, and what are some areas where Christians coming to the scriptures may have disagreements. Um, the, the, the temptation to make everything foundational is, is sort of the classic fundamentalist uh impulse that that often shows up mm -hmm. uh in which you um you, you begin making things that are second and even third tier issues at the level of first tier, tier issues and are ready to you know excommunicate anyone who who differs um i do want to leave a little bit of of room though for the the different branches of the of the christian tree to have their 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 own structural integrity so for example um, it may not be a first tier issue that is going to decide the salvation of someone, whether or not they they affirm certain um, uh, you, you know a, a, a certain view of exactly how the atonement works or exactly how the um, uh, you know the God's sovereignty and human responsibility um, at free will, how those things um, align. But it may, for the structural integrity of a particular denomination, that may actually be something that they would say is, well, we wouldn't say that someone who disagrees with this position is not necessarily a Christian, but we would say that it that their position falls outside of the the what what we see to be the most faithful expression of what Scripture teaches. Uh, the same would be true, for example, in my own tradition of uh, being a Baptist. Um, I recognize differences of 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 understanding with other believers as to the the proper mode and the proper subject of baptism. Uh, that doesn't mean that I necessarily that that doesn't mean that I'm going to to call into question mm -hmm. their their Christianity or their faith, but would recognize that that's an area where the the church has had uh, quite a bit of discussion and disagreement over the centuries, particularly in the early centuries of the church, and then mm -hmm. uh, um, back in the last four four hundred years or so. And so. Mm -hmm. Um, I, but I, but I recognize that if, if I were to be practicing infant baptism, um, that that's not a big o orthodoxy question, but it is one that, for my own denominational integrity and tradition, would put me outside the 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 line, so to speak, the structural integrity mm -hmm. of the. You uh, you could call it. Uh, you could use the metaphor of different homes in a neighborhood. Uh, each house is there, and 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 the Lord in His sovereignty has. Uh, even with the disunity in the church, has given different gifts uh, in different different traditions, different denominational uh, um, uh, uh, traditions from the church. So we might have, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the a house in a neighborhood where we might visit each other's houses, but at the end of the day, we have our 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 um, uh, that each house still maintains a certain kind of structural integrity. 
Um, C.S. Lewis used the example, the famous example of mere Christianity being we come out into the halls and we have great fellowship. But then mm -hmm. when it comes to the individual, the, when it comes to our actual worship and the, the practices and what we believe about the sacraments and things like that, we go back into our individual rooms for uh, for for that. And so there's a sense in which uh, the, the fundamentalist temptation is to make everything foundational, to to basically say this house and this house alone and this room in the in in the house so to speak is the is the only room where your 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 christian faith can be assured um that's not mm -hmm. something that i think uh the bible teaches i think that there's actually uh we see some examples even in scripture where christians can um may come to different agree uh, can agree to disagree on certain issues but then it's also not the, uh, um, the the witness of the church throughout the ages as well that we've we've learned sometimes through trial and error what are those foundational things that if we 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 move out of line there we're actually going to um, to affect the the overarching structure of the Christian faith and wind up losing other essential doctrines. Yeah. Well, one of the most interesting uh, pieces in your book was an early chapter where you talk about drift and some of the ways that we drift from orthodoxy, that often moving away from orthodoxy isn't so much an intentional choice as just drifting. Would you say more about that? Yeah, I I think we've got to recognize that um, we live in a day and age where there are all sorts of cultural currents that are all around us. Mm -hmm. And um, I would make the, the the case that unless we are actively opposing drift, we will be drifting just naturally. It just it just happens. I I use the example, you know, you're out in the ocean and you look back at the shore and you you ask yourself, what who moved my stuff? And then you realize, no, your stuff is still on the shore where you left it. It's you who, you know, imperceptibly to you, the, the current sort of drifted, sort of carried you out uh, of down, you know, down down the the the, the shoreline. Um, I think that that's what happens culturally as well. And so one of the things that I hope my book will be for readers is is a reorientation, the recognition that, you know, we're we we we're going to have this tendency to drift with certain cultural assumptions, positions, things that are taking place culturally, and sometimes without us even being aware of them. Uh, Chesterton has that great line, you know, that a, a dead thing can float downstream. It's a living thing that kicks against that sort of current that will take you downstream and you have to actually, to, to push upstream. And I think that that's, that's what, what I'm, I'm hoping the book will be for people will be a, a sort of a, a recentering with, you know, the uh, great tradition, uh, a recentering around those ecumenical mm -hmm. creeds and the, and the accurate summaries of scripture that they provide, um, a, a bringing ourselves back in line uh, with, with what is foundational, what is time tested. And um, I, I, I think unless we're opposing drift, we will naturally drift. So we've, we've, we've got to recognize ways in which the, the currents of this world are going to tug on our hearts, and we've got to, to actively and intentionally oppose that. And that's not a bad thing. That's a sign of life. It's a, when, you're, when you're seeking to stand firm, when the, the, the cultural currents are pulling you in a particular direction, it takes exertion. It takes activity. It's, it's also part of the adventure. It's part of the adventure of the Christian faith that I hope people will uh, that we'll recognize is as, as part of the task, us and our generation, just like all the generations that have come before us. Well, you, uh, you, you, you just mentioned adventure, and that's a word you use a lot in your book. Um, and that you, you uh, I think often we think of orthodoxy as this sort of dull, dry, somewhat sterile kind of thing. And you speak a lot of adventure. Your title talks about the thrill of orthodoxy. How has orthodoxy been an adventure for you? You know, I started reading theology and started kind of getting into cultural conversations that were that were taking place um, at a time when there was a lot of discussion about uh, reaching a postmodern culture and the, how postmodern sensibilities have have shifted and how we need new strategies, new ways of of speaking to people today. And, um, you know, I resonated with a lot. There, there was a lot in that, in those conversations that really resonated with me, um, thinking through the, the, some of the challenges that the church was facing, that the church was really not, not, not doing a great job at, at answering at the time. Uh, but the more I began, you know, following authors and listening to people and kind of, you know, engaging in some of those conversations, I realized as perceptive as some of those questions were, 
And as, 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 as good a job as they were at, at putting their finger on what are some of the challenges we're facing, a lot of the answers that were coming out um, at the time for me, I just, I realized this is really palatable and it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's overly adapting to postmodern sensibilities in ways that actually are leaving it, it's it's a it's a minimalistic type of of religious faith that actually is very well suited and tailored to uh to 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 the cultural sensibilities of people around us and it's not that it's 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 missing the sharp edge the sharp edge was always directed to the church of the previous generation not to the surrounding culture and i think the sharp edge of scripture actually does often challenge the church but it certainly also takes on the world and so it was around that time that I just, I started to, to realize this is boring. <laughs> like this is actually, this is taking a lot of sensibilities and a lot of things that are out there just swirling around and kind of baptizing them with sort of a, a, a Christian and, and a lot of convers a lot of talk about, you know, mystery and ambiguity and us not really having answers and things like that. And then the more I began engaging back into the Christian tradition, this goes back to church history and the more that I was doing work around the world, I was in, in conversation with believers in other parts of the world. I had lived for, for mm -hmm. several years in another part of the world. Um, the more I realized that the, the greater adventure was wow. not an adventure of inventing or adapting, but an adventure of discovering and applying. Um, that, that, that you are actually, you're stumbling upon something that is there that you have to reckon with. And I, I make the comparison in the book to, um, to, to being in a room that's air conditioned, you know, every, the, 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 the thermostat is, is, is right there. It is for the, you know, the perfectly tailored to your own sensibilities in the room versus having to actually go outside and deal with the weather, you know, whether it's really hot or whether it's really cold or whether it's a, there's a storm coming through or whatever and saying um, a lot of times we spend a lot of energy, I think, in creating a personalized, privatized, um, very adapted Christian faith that is perfectly suited to our own comfort and desires. When the Bible and the great Christian tradition are actually saying, no, orthodoxy is, is get you outside, where the it's not my weather or your weather, it's the weather, and we've got to adapt to it. Uh, it's there. It's it's a force to be reckoned with. It's like coming across a, a huge castle or something that you, you simply can't ignore it. And over time, I realized that's where the adventure is. The more I was reading back into the you know uh, um, uh, 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 Protestant reformers and then back into the 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 patristic era and the 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 church fathers and whatnot, I realized this is where the real excitement is: is not figuring out how to adapt the faith to fit people, but how to adapt people to better fit the faith. You know, I've always thought that uh, one of the uh, one of the cases that I've made sometimes for uh, the Christian faith is simply that you wouldn't make this up. We'd make up something that's far more comfortable and ultimately more dull, and that wouldn't have those edges that wouldn't uh, challenge us anywhere. Uh, I, I always I've suggested oftentimes that one of the things that might make the case for the Christian faith is simply that we wouldn't create create something like this, that it had to be something that uh, was revealed to us rather than something that we just cooked up. Yeah, and we also don't maintain something like this without the Spirit's yeah. guidance. I yeah. mean, that's one, that's one of the beautiful things about, uh, or when we talk about orthodoxy versus heresy, is that in a lot of ways heresies are always duller than orthodoxy? They're dealt, they're 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 shaving off the sharp edges. They're they're trading in the both and glorious paradoxes that stand at the heart of the faith, and they're 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 asking us to choose. They're making both ands and either or, and they're made and 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 doing so in a way that actually is reducing Christianity. Uh, they market themselves really well. Heresies are always really well marketed as uh, something that's new and innovative and it's pushing against and it's seen as progress and whatnot. But when you actually look at the heresies at a little bit closer, you realize that orthodoxy is where the power is. And 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 we it seems like it's not only is not not only is Christianity something that we wouldn't have invented on our own. It's it's too complicated for that. And 
gloriously complex. Um, it's also something that without the Spirit's guidance, we wouldn't hold on to. And yeah. every generation, it seems like we 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 expend energy, or some do at least. It seems like people stand up and they and they're trying to alter and adapt Christianity in ways that actually lead away from the power uh, of 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 the gospel. That 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 glorious complexity and paradox that's at the heart of the faith. Yeah, and I think you're already elaborating some of this, but I, I wanted to. One of the most striking things I thought you made, you know, uh, said in the book, was that. You know, most of a, a lot of times we we get accused, those of us who would hold to orthodoxy of being narrow. And you actually, you assert that it's heresy that's narrow, that it's orthodoxy that's broad. Uh, explain that just a little bit more. Yeah, so I've got to just mention my indebtedness to G.K. Chesterton on this because yeah. one of the uh, one of the the chapters in his classic book Orthodoxy actually does this um, far, far better than I probably ever could. But I was I was trying to to take that particular argument and tease it out a little more and and argue it in a in a new way uh, for for a, a a new generation. But um, he he makes the case that you know what Christianity is bringing together. Is not um, uh, the 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 bringing he, Christianity is insisting on both ends constantly, whereas heresies are always wanting to to chop off you know and and make things either or. And what Chesterton says, and what I think the the Christian tradition has shown, is that when when Christianity brings together things that you would think would be separate, for example, that that Jesus is both one hundred percent God and one hundred percent man. Uh, like an example like that, when when Christianity puts that together, it doesn't do so by watering down one or the other or by mixing them into some sort of amalgamation where, you know, um, where where you get the essence of either side of that loss. No, orthodoxy insists on both truths in their fiery fullness. You know, for example, God being both distant and other, totally transcendent, mm -hmm. um, and also near and close that he's imminent, he's close by. Christianity is, doesn't say you have to choose one or the other. You get both of those truths, you know. Over and over and over again, we see throughout the, 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 the Christian tradition that whereas the heretics are always wanting to take one aspect of truth and then divorce it from the, the other Christian truths and then use it as a weapon against it. So, you know, the Docetists, for example, say that Jesus wasn't actually a man. He just appeared to be a man because it would be demeaning, you know, for 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 Jesus as the Son of God to actually have taken on human flesh in a way that was beyond appearance, you know, they were trying to safeguard the the godness of Jesus, the divinity of Jesus, by by sacrificing the realness of his humanity. Of course, the Arian controversy was exactly the opposite way. Uh, they they said Jesus was divine in some sense, but they put him on the the creature side of that create creator creature distinction, um, and said that he was uh, uh, that 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 in, in order to safeguard the the godness of God the Father, they wound up demoting the the Son, whereas the the Trinity comes with this uh, extraordinary expression of bringing together things that are uh, that you might say are opposites or that shouldn't go together, mm -hmm. and yet insisting they do. Um, and so, when I say that heresy is more narrow, I it it really is a, I think it's borne out by the different heresies that we have uh, have seen over the centuries, and that's where orthodoxy and the the thrill really comes in is that you recognize, uh, no, this is where the power is. This is where you're actually plugged into something that 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 is going to uh, to be electrifying in its in its uh, in its results. Hey, we need to take a break here to tell people about your book and how they can get it. We actually have a special uh, deal with uh, with the publisher that uh, is quite wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen here. Uh, the book we're, we've been talking about today is The Thrill of Orthodoxy, and uh, it's available at University Press. And I just realized we have a, a mistake in the link here. Uh, the correct link, I believe, is in uh, is in the share is in the chat. Uh, we'll clear that up if not. Uh, the Thrill of Orthodoxy is available uh, with free shipping when uh, purchased with the code 40 IVCF23 at checkout. And you can use that code uh, actually for all of your purchases at the website while you're there. So uh, uh, we do encourage you to pick that up. And let me double check the chat to make sure we gave you the 
the correct link is in the chat. So just ignore what you saw on the screen as far as links. Um, but you have the correct one in the chat. Uh, Okay, and uh, we would love to have some audience questions here. If uh, the, those of you who are uh, listening, uh, if there have been things you've been wondering as, as uh, Trevor and I have talked about, uh, things that we haven't touched on, we'd love to hear your questions. Um, while, while people are thinking about that, I'm a, you know, one of the things I wanted to come back to, it, it actually seems like within evangelical subculture especially, uh, we've, we're in a place where we're, we're celebrating doubt these days. Uh, you know, that uh, I, I think there's been kind of a reaction that in the past saying that doubt, you know, to have questions and, and, and so forth is sinful. But now it seems almost like we celebrate that. And I wondered if you think that can be taken too far. I do think it can be taken too far. I think, I think there's a couple of dangers we've got to avoid there. Um, one of the, the the statements I make in the book that I, I think is important to keep in mind is that um, the answer to a culture where doubt is celebrated should not be a church where doubt is always condemned. Um, there are different kinds of questions. There are different kinds of, of doubts. Um, and I think we've got to be more pastoral in our approach as we, as we discern um, what kind of heart questions are coming from? Um, what what those questions look like? What what doubts are are like? So, it is true though that we do live in an age where doubt is seen as um, dangerous and celebrate. You know, it's celebrating and it's it's something that's um, edgy, so to speak. Uh, the church the church can't fall for that. We at the end of the day, our posture toward doubt should be like that of the man that that Jesus talks about, whose whose son was was possessed by a demon mm -hmm. who, who says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. It's, it's faith seeking understanding. And there are going to be times in which we do have questions that we ask, but I think we've got to do a, a, a better job of, of discerning the, the intent and the heart behind particular questions. And sometimes that doesn't happen overnight. It happens over time. Um, sometimes we ask questions because we are genuinely seeking God. Other times we're trying to evade uh, the authority of scripture in our lives or, or God's, uh, God's design. You know, the, 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 the question the serpent asks in Genesis three is, did God really say, um, that, that wasn't a, that wasn't an innocent question. Um, and so I, questions are never just questions. I think we, um, in, in, in the church, we've got to recognize that, um, uh, there are different doubts that come from different kinds of places and we need to be able to recognize the difference while still maintaining a, the place for the church to really wrestle through difficult questions that come about uh, through faith. Um, you know, Thomas got a reprimand, but Jesus also showed him his scars of love. Mm. And so there's a sense in which um, we, we, Jesus loves doubters. Um, and, and I think, I think we, we, we don't want to run the route of the, of the culture and celebrating all kinds of doubt as if it's all good, but neither do we want to be the kind of church that is unable to discern the different kinds of doubt, the different kinds of questions that may arise and condemn all doubt as bad. I think we've got to be a place where we should recognize certain questions are going up. We want to respond to them as best as we can, uh, with scripture as our, as our authority. Hey, Rick has a great question for us. Um, what do you see as the place of tradition in interpreting scripture? Uh, do we read scripture through the light of the church in some way? I do think we read scripture through the light of the church in some way because we all come with particular presuppositions to the biblical text. No one's really a blank slate when we come to, to the scriptures. Uh, a few years ago, I had the awesome privilege of being on the translation committee for the Christian Standard Bible which is a translation that launched in 2017. And um, I, I was in that, in that position as the, the publisher. I was sitting in that, in that room as the publisher, not the Greek expert or the Hebrew expert. Don't be alarmed. Um, <laughs> but uh, being, in, being a fly on the wall in those conversations where we had different scholars from multiple denominational backgrounds uh, was, really, was really illuminating to me because you know, I mean, there's, we had, you know, Presbyterian, we had Lutheran, we had Baptist, we had non-denominational, different kinds of, of people in that, in that room that, that all bring to their reading of the text, a, they, they come from a particular background. And I remember in answering questions about Bible translation, 
And so if, if, again, if we're talking about Bible translation, you can only imagine what Bible interpretation looks like. But back to the Bible translation question, I remember answering questions occasionally from pastors who would say, well, what, you know, why does it matter? You just read the Greek and translate it. You just read the original language and translate it. it you know, what, why does it matter that you have different denominations at the table? And the answer to that question is because um, we, no one, no one's coming to that biblical text, even in Greek, translating it into Hebrew, without particular presuppositions and assumptions that do come along with the particular denominational heritage and background of the people at the, at the table. Um, you know, it's often said that the person, that sometimes the most biased person at the table is the one who thinks that they don't have any biases, right? You you you've got to recognize that um, that you come to the to to the text with with particular presuppositions. And, and that's why I think those denominational, that, that back and forth denominationally is actually a really good thing because it, 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 it can help us question some of those, those presuppositions we might, we might bring to the text. So if that's the case in Bible translation, which I think it is, then even more so in Bible interpretation. So yes, we come to the scriptures reading in light of a particular tradition. That's why I think it's important for us to read outside of our own tradition it's important for us to go back to the scriptures with people from other traditions that may be challenging us, pushing us here and there on particular points. It helps us recognize what's fundamental and foundational in light of the, you know, what we might say would be the the, the rule of faith. Or uh, if we go back to the, the creed, the creeds are a way of, they're not only an exposition of what scripture teaches, they are also, they are also guardrails so that we read the scriptures back through the light of those creeds as well. Um, they help us to 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 you know maintain the faith. I, it's very easy for someone to uh, to to stand up and say, you know, um, everybody else in the Christian tradition is wrong. Here's how I know because I read the scripture this way. Generally speaking, if you're the only one, you know, or, or your particular group is the only group that's ever read the scriptures in this way out of all of church history and tradition, the burden of proof is on you, not the rest of of the church tradition. Uh, that uh, uh, when it comes to to whether or not it's it's in line with orthodoxy or not, so I think it's a fantastic question. Yeah, I we we definitely the creeds come from scripture, but yes, we also do read the scriptures back through that lens of this is what the church has has said are the the, mm -hmm. the, the guardrails uh, for for what um, the the rule of faith for how we should interpret the scriptures. Great. Well, we still have some, we still have some time for some more questions if people want to get things into the chat. Um, uh, as as you're doing that, uh, one of the things you talk about is the 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 tendency today for us to do deeds over creeds. You know, to say why are we fighting about the the this this doctrinal minutia? Uh, let's what we just really need to do is to go out and love and serve people, uh, which there's nothing wrong with necessarily. Uh, you even talk at one point about uh, you talk about details mattering, even in, even the detail as small as a single letter, uh, a single a single Greek letter that uh, uh, the church had a, a had a significant controversy about. Uh, why do details matter? Well, not all the details matter as much as that one vowel, that one letter. That was the the difference between uh, orthodoxy and the Arian heresy. That one that one particular letter. Thankfully, not all the letters are that important uh, when we're when we are um, debating things. There are there are there are places where there is minutia. You know, there is places where there are places where Christians can have great conversations even within the same congregation, and uh, come to differences of opinion. And it's not going to necessarily be a, a threat to orthodoxy, uh, the you know the the faith as once for all delivered to the saints. Um, but at the end of the day, the details matter because doctrine doctrine matters for our deeds. So the the idea that you can divorce creeds from deeds just doesn't just doesn't work. Um, as soon as you say, you know, forget all of the theology stuff, we just need, you know, we just need to love God and love our neighbors and get on with the mission and be like Jesus to the world. Okay, well, as soon as you say that, well, then you've got to answer questions. Okay, what is our mission? What, what are we, how are we to be like Jesus? Are we supposed to go around 
healing people, calming storms, casting out demons? Are we like Jesus in his teach, teaching ability? We can't be like Jesus in his dying for the sins of the world and then rising from the dead. So in, in what, what, who is the Jesus we're supposed to be like? Uh, what does it mean to love our neighbors in intangible ways? What does love look like? What, you know, is, are we just taking the world's understanding of love and then just dropping Christian, or are we letting the Christian tradition and the scriptures actually define what love actually looks like, what love means, uh, what it would look like. So the, 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 the problem with just saying doctrines don't matter, it's just deeds, is that you don't, you really can't do the deeds without having a clear understanding of how they are connected to, to particular points of doctrine. Um, and so, and so at, at the end of the day, yes, we don't want to divorce the two. And the Bible has a lot to say about those who would just simply cling to knowledge and then not actually live out the faith. Um, but we are living out the faith, not just my faith personally, but the faith. And so we've got to know what the faith is. Um, Jesus asked the question, who do you say that I am? And I think we could say that all of Christian theology has been a response to that question. That question matters. Uh, it matters for our life and for our actions and practice. It also really does matter as well because we're talking about a real person. Um, no one would say that the details don't matter if you're talking about someone you love and someone, you know, takes your your wife or your husband or your son or your daughter and, and grossly misrepresents them, the way they talk about them. That would get you up in arms. Why? Because the words matter, the affirmations matter, the details matter. Uh, because we're talking about we're talking about God, an encounter with the living God, and who He is and His person. That that really does matter. So yeah, I I I think we've got to always be careful in our culture today. Where we we tend to to slide over pretty quickly to a pragmatism that says only focus on what's practical, leave the doctrinal stuff to the side, which I want to say. Don't divorce deeds from creeds, doctrine and practice. They go together uh, and we need to keep them together. I always appreciate Paul's exhortation to Timothy. Watch your life and doctrine closely and how, the, and ha how right. Paul puts those two together. And I, I, I think that's what you're saying here. Um, Jason observes, it seems that the culture currently asserts radical autonomy and thus functionally that we are all to reinvent the wheel regarding the view of God, doctrine, et cetera. And thus the arguments in the book are especially important. How might we approach those who are radically skeptical and yet claim the name Christian? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, I love, what I love about that is the, is the recognition of where we are culturally, like recognizing what some of those cultural currents are gonna be. Um, every culture tends to drift in some way. Not all cultures shift in the same way. And the, the, the perceptiveness of that question recognizes the radical autonomy at the heart of, of, our, of our culture. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I, that I found helpful in just in, in talking about this has been to, um, to, to flip on its head the idea of authenticity. Um, because when you're talking to someone who's skeptical of the idea of orthodoxy and who's thinking of religion in terms of something that's autonomous, privatized, individualistic, personal, um, the, the tendency is going to be to take Christianity, to take whatever parts you like about it, whatever parts you think are going to make your life better, and maybe, you know, go with that, uh, or to reject Christianity altogether and to say it's not for me because I've got to be the master of my own destiny. I've got to be the captain of my own ship. I've got to be the, the I've got to be the person who's in charge of my own life. And Christianity, I mean, frankly, cuts against that. Um so I, I take the idea of authenticity to say um, to Christians who, who go that route, uh, who think that they can kind of just pick and choose the parts of the Christian faith that they like, that's going to make their life better. I say, uh, you may think you're being authentic by incorporating elements of Christianity into your life as you see fit, but you, that's not actually the authentic Christian faith. And so we got to move away. I want to move Christians away from the idea of me personally being authentic myself with my own personal religion to recognizing that we're called to something that's bigger than ourselves, that's greater than ourselves, that's outside of ourselves. And asking the question, do I have an authentic Christianity to which I am being true? Not am I being true to myself with Christianity sprinkled on, 
but is there an authentic Christian faith that I'm going to bring myself in line with? And that actually is where you bring about the adventure of nonconformity. Uh, we live in a day and age where no one wants to conform to anyone else's vision for their life, right? I've got to be me. I've got to be true to myself, you know? Um, I want people to recognize, okay, if you run that, if you run that direction in our culture, you're actually being conformist to that nonconformist impulse because everybody's doing that. I mean, that's what everyone expects themselves to do, right? What I want to do is flip that on its head and say the most nonconforming rebellious thing you can do in a world where everybody says be true is the highest goal of life. The most nonconformist thing you could do is actually to conform your life to something bigger than yourself, to bring your life in line, to conform to Christ, for example. So, so I, I guess in answer to that question, I think we've got to find ways to flip the script a bit, to challenge the presuppositions of people that have that sort of radically autonomous way of seeing the world uh, that overly individualized, personalized, privatized understanding of religion to, to bring them into contact with something that's going to shake them up a little bit and ask the question, you know, um, uh, are, are there ways that we can actually turn the tables a bit so that those who think that they are autonomous, we show that they're really not. Those who think they are nonconformist, we can show that they really are conforming. And then, and then, and then bring Christianity as something that's fresh and different and that they wouldn't expect, and that they they got to reckon with, they got they got to deal with, making that putting that on the table for discussion. Well, hey, we're coming toward the end of our time, Trevin, and I want to kind of give you the last word, any last encouragements you want to give us, whatever. Well, I want to pre I want to thank everybody that's been on the call um, because I think this is a every generation. Uh, has got to rediscover the the thrill and wonder of of Christian truth and Christian teaching, and our generation is no exception. Um, the question that we have before us is one that I hope that all of us are asking. Uh, if all of us are on cr Christians on the call, someone delivered the treasure to us. Someone passed down the treasure to you. Mm -hmm. You received the gospel. You received the good news of the Christian faith because someone passed it down. We're going on 2,000 years now where people have continued to believe this really unlikely message that some guy from a backwater area of, you know, the Middle East 2,000 years ago walked around teaching and preaching and had a ministry of healing and whatnot, uh, wound up dying on the cross and then showing up three days later, wowing, shocking his disciples, and then sending his spirit so that here we are 2000 years later in a very scientific technological age we look at that entire story and say makes total sense there's no reason that story should make sense except that it's true and the power is still enduring and someone shared that story with you and so i hope the burden that we feel on this call is that we're going to ask the question will we pass down the treasure that we've received to the generation that comes after us uh will we pass down the treasure as it has been received, um, not try to alter it or adapt it until eventually there's no Christianity left to adapt, but where we will, we will pass it on in, in the form that, um, that we've received it. And so that others can feel that same thrill of orthodoxy and can know the same salvation in Christ that we've, that we've come to know. That's really the question. Every generation has to answer that question, uh, our, in the family, in the church, in society, and so I hope that uh, this book, if you if you pick it up and uh, read it, I, I hope that you'll be blessed by it, challenged by it, provoked by it here and there, um, but that uh, it will just bring about in your own life that sense of determination, that sense of desire to want to pass the, the treasure on to the next generation. Well, Trevin, thank you so much for joining us today, for challenging us. Uh, I, I, I love your challenge in the book for us to pass, pass to the next generation, to uh, remember the, the transforming power of the gospel that goes far beyond any good things that we can do of ourselves. Uh, that is really the treasure that, we, that has been entrusted us. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we do want to let people know once again about the book. Uh, and uh, as well as we want to let you know about what's coming next. Uh, in our Emerging Scholars Conversations. Um, 
So uh, let me let me get to that screen, please here. Again, the book we're talking about today is The Thrill of Orthodoxy. Ignore the uh, uh, URL on the screen. Uh, there's uh, one in your chat that you can use uh, that will work well for you. Um, and you can uh, purchase the book at the University Press website for 40% off with free shipping. If you use the code 40IVCF23 at checkout, and you can actually use that for all of your purchases there. Uh, we also want to let you know about uh, some of what's coming up uh, in the next month. Uh, we've got a wonderful program uh, uh, in December. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, actually, uh, Trevin talked about in his book about Dor Dorothy Sayers and her assertion that the dogma is the drama, that uh, actually the, the very details of the faith are what are exciting and dramatic. Uh, in the story. Uh, we're going to be talking with Catherine Ware next month, and she's the, uh, she has uh, uh, worked on a, an annotated edition of Dorothy Sayers, The Man Born to be King, uh, which was a play uh, that was broadcast on the BBC from December of 1941 till October of 1942. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a new uh, critical and annotated edition. And uh, uh, she's going to talk about uh, the plays, their background, Sayer's creative process, and the ongoing significance of the life of Christ today. Uh, and uh, uh, this might be one that you want to listen to again or for the first time to the story of the man who was born to be and still is king. Uh, our, our conversation is going to be hosted by uh, Hannah Eagleson who's our Associate Director of the Emerging Scholars Network and uh, uh, has a doctorate in English literature. So is really, and actually loves this work. So I think we're in for a treat. Finally, uh, this conversation has been brought to you by, sorry, uh, the Emerging Scholars Network. And we'd invite you uh, to join this, uh, uh, the Emerging Scholars Network for free at blog.emergingscholars.org if you're not already a member. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter uh, at ESNIVCF. And uh, this uh, video will be uh, uploaded on YouTube and uh, as well as uh, over 30 other uh, conversations that we've been involved in over the last few years. And you can, you'll be able to see that at youtube.com slash ESNIVCF. Finally, we know this is, uh, you're coming toward, we're coming toward the end of the uh calendar year, and many people do year-end charitable giving. And if uh, the programs in our ESN conversations have been ones that you've enjoyed, we hope uh, that you will consider uh, supporting ESN in your charitable giving as well. And there is a link in the chat that you can use if you'd like to make a donation uh, to help cover some of the costs that are involved in setting up these conversations. So we thank you all for joining us today. Trevin, thank you so much. Uh, for being with us. Uh, we also just want to acknowledge uh, the support of InterVarsity Press in arranging these interviews and uh, our appreciation for them. So thank you, everybody. And uh, uh, we're going to stop the recording and we'll take just a few minutes if anybody wants to stay on and ask any other questions.